Before we get started with um, uh, the last lecture, just uh, please remember all of you at this point should have received an email from me that's talked about the final exam. If you have not received that email, please get in touch with me. I'm happy to do uh, that. Uh, and uh, that's basically the last hurdle other than having to sit with this lecture, of course. Um, and if I make sure that you obviously take the final exam. Uh, and please do take it seriously. Uh, I know it's going to be even more difficult to uh, uh, sort of focus once you leave, probably. Uh, but um, the final exam does still count for a good percentage of the grade. So it really can determine uh, things, especially if you're on the borderline between two grades. Uh, the final exam can make a difference. So please do uh, take it seriously, study hard, make sure, obviously, it goes without saying, bring home books. For this class, if you wish to study, um, or if you have an honest opinion, but uh, make sure that you have the book um, for the course. All right. And as I said, uh, feel free to. Um, I have all this hours uh, the next few days, but after that, of course, most of you, if you have any questions about the material, feel free to email me. I'm you know, happy to, to answer that ahead of time. And of course, as you know, if there's any. Uh, Technical problem on the actual final exam, uh, just shoot me an email. And uh, usually it goes through your solve fairly quickly. I hope at this point I've not ironed out most of the problems, but I don't guarantee uh, that there will be no problems. Like this would be a lovely time for Blackboard to go down. <laughs> um, I just sent it out to the universe. Hopefully it won't happen. All right. Today, what we're going to be speaking about, the, the very broad category is new contact. What we're going to see is a very broad period, uh, toward the end of the period we're studying, but in fact, beyond it, what we're going to see is a new contact beginning to grow up in many different ways. And the first of these are, are uh, really a renewed energy on missionary efforts. Um, what we're going to see uh, in uh, the Muslim world uh, is, in fact, many Muslims are going to begin to um, embrace this new form uh, of Islam uh, known as Sufism. Uh, and uh, Sufism is a term uh, that comes from a uh, narrative word referring to the kind of very colorful uh, woolen garments that people who are part of this group uh, would traditionally wear. The uh, people who embraced this particular school of Islam, known as Sufis, uh, were people who, uh, in many cases, were people who really um, um, were very devout Muslims, people who really took the faith very seriously. Uh, and we know, too, that there are also people who studied a lot of Muslim theology, Muslim law, so they're academics. And people who most Muslims tend to think were fairly pious. Um, and, uh, and on top of those other things, they also were known to give a lot of money to the poor, which just seems to be a primary version of Islam. The, 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 the thing that would have set them apart, though, from many other Muslim schools of thought is that uh, Sufis really tend to think that um, all of this theology that people tended to read gets to be awfully dry at a certain point. Uh, and, uh, Rather than just um, you know, sit there reading different theological statements, uh, they wanted to go out there to try to find this mystical union with Allah. Uh, they felt that you could work yourself up in this kind of ecstatic passion, uh, really, and become one with Allah. It was not just a matter to be sort of read about and contemplated. So Sufis would have these rousing sermons, really very emotion-packed sermons. Uh, they would sing all sorts of songs. 
Uh, and they would even actually do this kind of a, a very sort of spirited dancing uh, that supposedly was all uh, intended to help them reach a mystical union with God. Some, um, some Muslim thinkers at the time said that uh, Sufis were a bunch of heretics. Uh, they said, in fact, you guys are spending so much time with all of these sort of extracurricular pursuits that um, you may actually end up straying into heresy without knowing it. You know, you're not really paying attention uh, to the purity of the doctrine. With that being said, though, this did not dent in the least bit the popularity that the Sufis enjoyed. And in the Muslim world, they become some of the most important uh, thinkers. What's more, and the reason I'm bringing this up in this uh, particular context, uh, is that Sufis uh, begin to take the show on the road. Uh, they, they want to uh, not only personally achieve unity with Allah, they want to go out there and spread the word. And so they actually begin to become missionaries in the Muslim world. And uh, we see that Sufis um, really... But their, their strategy in, um, in um, missionary efforts is don't worry about the, the small stuff. Don't worry about all these sort of doctrinal points. What is really important is that you love Allah above all else. And if you do that, in time everything else will follow. There's no need to sort of uh, worry about all the teachings that were popular in Islam. And, uh, in many cases, too, we see that as missionaries, the Sufis were known to be very tolerant of pre-Muslim ways. They said, listen, maybe you guys are doing slightly different festivals, but if you could just say you're doing them in honor of Allah, uh, then it'd be fine. You don't, have, you don't have to necessarily embrace all of the rituals that Muslims have. Uh, and uh, really, uh, the reason why all this is important is that in many regions uh, of the world, Sufis uh, become a, uh, a constant presence. And they really uh, tend to spread the word of Islam much more effectively uh, than many missionaries had done in the past. Uh, so, for instance, um, the area in northwest uh, India, which today, in fact, has most of which has basically become a separate country, Pakistan, um, this starts out as, as a region uh, that is heavily missionized by Sufi. You can understand um, why many people in India uh, would really find Sufis and their teaching attractive. Uh, Sufis said, for instance, that uh, uh, unlike um, Hindus, you, there was no uh, concept of caste within Islam. Everyone was equal, as long as you were a Muslim. Uh, we also see that, um, we said Buddhism uh, was really a presence of those small. In India, um, not everyone can reach Nirvana. It's really quite difficult. Uh, so, we also think disillusioned Buddhists also were attracted by Islam. On top of that, we really think that uh, in many cases, um, in India, they always had a lot of respect for these kind of um, uh, highly religious people who are detached from the world. And so Sufis really kind of fit right into that, um, and right into that, that scene. Now, I don't want, I don't mean to say that there was this huge, um, uh, wave of conversions to Islam immediately in India. We don't think uh, that they ever become anywhere near the majority. Maybe at most in India, around 20% of people became uh, Muslim. And uh, in certain areas of southern India, Muslims made absolutely no headway at all. What is interesting to us, though, for the, uh, the long term uh, sort of uh, uh, shape, though, of India and again, the countries that were formed from it later. Uh, is that unlike so many other religious traditions that simply got absorbed into India's bloodstream uh, and that would just become part of, the, of Hinduism, um, Islam was so different from Hinduism that it could not be simply even alive by it. Um, and in fact, um, it, it always uh, it became really a very a distinct tradition and minority group within India. Uh, that was uh, apart from the rest of, of, of the Indians. Um, the, the wider sort of, um, uh, we never will talk much about this, but the, the wider sort of implications of this too was that many people who end up um, converting uh, to Islam 
uh, and in fact, many people who become Sufis themselves will in time go out as merchants and sometimes scholars uh, to areas like, for instance, of uh, today's modern day Indonesia, uh, and also will bring Islam with them. So, in fact, um, the uh, missionary uh, journeys in Islam uh, had not ended. In a similar period of time, there are new Christian missionaries as well. Uh, and although I could point to many examples, uh, this is just one uh, named John of Monte Corvino, uh, who is, uh, as you can see by his habit, he is actually a Franciscan. And he, John came from Italy originally. Um, John would travel to, us, to uh, uh, China as a representative of the Pope and uh, became a, actually become an archbishop in what today is modern day Beijing. And he really, uh, in so many ways, John did try his best uh, to promote Christianity uh, in China. Um, we know, for instance, uh, he trans he takes a translation of the New Testament, uh, he translates Psalms, uh, and it has he has several churches built. Okay. We do see John tries his absolute best to both uh, baptize uh, Chinese children and uh, other uh, ethnic minorities within China as well to try to begin to teach the Roman Catholic rituals. From what we can figure out, though, uh, John does receive some sort of uh, renown among people he uh, talks to, and he is respected. Uh, but he really ends up, um, the mission itself, just in terms of raw numbers, is never really very successful. Uh, and, uh, at least some people think that uh, um, this is in part because he, in terms of what kind of resources he could be given, uh, by the Roman Catholic Church. There were very few altogether. Uh, and some people would also say his point of view is so far from many of the people he's preaching to, who in many cases, of course, also had a long intellectual tradition um, that um, he really didn't tend to lead many people over to Christianity. There are also, in this, in a, this similar period, individual travelers who begin to travel um, from east to west. Uh, in some cases, from west to east. Um, and this one uh, that in some cases really does not fit into any really category uh, very cleanly uh, is a monk uh, by the name of Ruban Sauma, um, who was a Christian priest and a monk uh, who, uh, interestingly enough, had, uh, had Turkish ancestry. Uh, but um, to just give you one more example of how. Um, the Mongols would use anybody who had any kind of talent. Um, he ends up actually being essentially recruited by the Mongols, um, although he is a Christian priest, and that he actually is recruited as an ambassador um, for uh, the Mongols when they're dominant. And uh, the goal of Salomon's mission to Western Europe was very simple. Okay, he wanted to establish a military alliance uh, between uh, the people of Western Europe uh, and the, uh, the Mongols to be able then to crush uh, Muslims on both sides. And we know that he definitely made it uh, to Rome and other places in Western Europe because we have some of the letters that his Mongol masters uh, produced uh, to offer to the Pope. And he also, in addition to meeting the Pope, he meets with the King of France and England. Uh, we think ultimately um, Salomon's mission uh, was a complete failure, um, the diplomatic uh, mission, and that there never really was any uh, grand alliance of uh, Christians and Mongols. In fact, Mongols eventually uh, would, many of them would gravitate towards Islam rather than Christianity. And that, that this actually, we, uh, the, the main reason I mentioned Salomon is that unlike many of the other people we're talking about, we actually have um, a uh, a diary more or less, a travel log he wrote about his time uh, traveling in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, he has all these sort of wonderful observations about, like, for instance, uh, he actually witnesses a battle in Western Europe uh, between two opposing armies. And the one thing he's very surprised about is that, uh, unlike the Mongols, um, Western Europeans don't appear to want to kill civilians in the course of their battles. But the Mongols, that was really what they did. Uh, so um, they didn't have any. He found it very weird. 
while he's there too, um, Saoma says, well, this is my one chance to do the Rome, and so he actually does decide to do some pilgrimage while he's there. He goes to a lot of different Roman churches, uh, and he goes to um, um, all sorts of um, masses uh, and celebrations during Holy Week too. Uh, so he actually is one of our very few um, eyewitnesses to papal liturgies in the Middle Ages at all. Um, I can say. Another name of an individual traveler who might be slightly more familiar to you, I'm hoping, uh, to ever play the pool game, uh, this is Marco Polo. Marco Polo um, was, came from a family of merchants who uh, lived in and around Venice. Uh, and uh, he is most famous uh, as part of this family for having traveled through Mongol territories. And, uh, although uh, it would be amazing to us, um, he actually uh, not only meets um, the great Khan, so the main leader of the Mongols, um, but in fact, it appears that um, the uh, the leader of the Mongols actually uh, really liked Marco Polo. They formed a personal connection, it appears, at some point. Uh, in part because uh, Marco Polo appears to have been very good at learning languages. Uh, and uh, he had a gift of gab. Uh, he was a fantastic storyteller. Um, he was a very good conversationalist. Uh, and uh, uh, that may be part of the reason uh, why um, he actually uh, he's eventually taken in uh, by the court of the Mongols and given work. Um, so far as we can tell, um, the, one of the great problems with Marco Polo's story is that Marco Polo has a very high opinion of himself, uh, and he really talks up exactly how important he was among the Mongols, you know, in the power structure, which we think is basically a, a, a lie. Uh, and we don't think he was ever extremely important. Important enough, probably, to be given a, a, a basically a governorship of a small area. Uh, and he did actually complete at least one diplomatic mission for the Mongols. So he did have some authority, but um, nothing like um, he would claim. And uh, Marco Polo ended up with, with spent 17 years uh, in China before finally returning home. And once he got there, um, he collaborated uh, with the uh, uh, the storyteller to write down what happened to him while he was in China. And uh, many of these stories would become wildly exaggerated. Uh, but the point of his story was to essentially sell books. Uh, and uh, you know, he wanted to tell cool stories if he were to do that. They did. But the, uh, the last of these kind of um, individual travelers who is very important uh, is now a Muslim traveler. And this is a man by the name of Ibn Battuta. Um, Ibn Battuta, uh, I mean, we know that um, Muslims love travel literature. They used to write lots of it. Uh, but in fact, most of um, the stories we have from them, and most of the stories, uh, most of the life tales of Muslim merchants, we don't have anymore. But we do have Ibn Battuta's uh, enormous sort of uh, travel log. Uh, that really is one of the great works of travel literature from this or any other period. Ibn Battuta uh, was a Muslim, and the vast majority of his uh, journeys are within Muslim territories. He goes out of his way to, to go with them. And uh, Ibn Battuta will, uh, was born in Morocco, uh, but then uh, over a course of around 30 years, he'll travel around 75,000 miles. Which is not bad altogether, by the way, uh, when you, uh, you, of course, you have to rely on either your feet uh, or animals. Uh, and among the places he visits, he will go to uh, Spain, Asia Minor, uh, both West and East Africa, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, Iran, uh, India, uh, finally at the end of his life toward uh, China as well. Ibn Battuta really um, he wears many different um, um, uh, hats, more or less. He's a traveler. At some point, he's a pilgrim. Uh, he actually does as Muslims are supposed to do. He makes uh, the pilgrimage to the city of Mecca. In fact, in his case, twice. Uh, he meets with Sufis and talks about their religious ideas. Uh, he also was personally a legal scholar. 
And uh, just to show you how unified the Muslim world is at this time, um, while he's in India, he needs to uh, pick up a little extra money. He decides to become a judge, a Muslim judge. And uh, the uh, education, the uh, legal education of Muslims was so standardized that he could simply immediately start working as a judge in India among Muslims with no problem. Uh, and uh, he also, along the way, he'll often travel with uh, um, different Muslim merchants. And, uh, again, really, um, we do see that Ibn Battuta along the way um, really tries to go within Muslim territory, um, and uh, he really stresses how much people you know, really have the same sort of uh, background and faith, and their language, their law. But with that being said, we also think that Ibn Battuta at times was very um, critical of some of the Muslim territories he went to, uh, especially ones that had not been Muslim as long as uh, some of the core Muslim territories. And so um, he often uh, recoils in horror when he sees he goes to certain places where, for instance, uh, women have a lot more freedom than they did in uh, some of the territories. Or he sees, in some cases, uh, uh, Muslims drinking wine and alcohol, which horrifies him. <coughs> the worst of all, though, for him, as far as he was concerned, is when he actually uh, arrives in China. Uh, and uh, China was so foreign to him um, and that uh, he really could not make uh, uh, any sense of it at all. And, uh, and just to show you how his worldview was, he could not understand how the Chinese had managed to prosper as much as they had uh, because they weren't Muslim. I mean, why would God reward people who were uh, so obviously pagan? <coughs> right. All of this is a lead up. However, you might say many of these, these uh, individual journeys I've been talking about are fairly small scale affairs, and so they were. Uh, and what I'm going to uh, finish up by talking about then uh, for the rest of the time uh, is a much broader series of journeys that in fact will have a much larger payout for the world. Uh, and this is something sometimes referred to as the age of discovery. Um, between the year 1400 and the year 1800, approximately, uh, Western European sailors will then uh, start this, uh, this fantastic series of exploratory bird voyages, which by the end would take them to uh, every single place on Earth. These journeys were very expensive, uh, but the, the dividends they would pay uh, would ultimately be massive. Um, just to, for understanding of the world geography, um, and uh, then uh, the, their ability then to, to exploit the new knowledge that they had uh, to be able to create all these new networks of communication on exchange. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, it meant that they would get a lot of money for what they had done. Why do Western Europeans begin to travel in such large numbers during this period? Well, uh, really, um, some of the early journeys uh, in the period that we're talking about really start off at a very small scale. And in fact, one of the, the basic leaders uh, in uh, Western European exploration is teeny little Portugal. Uh, and uh, one of Portugal's problems, as you can see by this map, uh, is that uh, they, uh, they share, uh, uh, they, they sh share this, this same area of Spain with whom they were at war with frequently. Uh, and then in fact, what the Portuguese sailors begin to do, little by little, is to creep out of Portugal, in part just to get basic natural resources at the beginning, that it was very difficult to get uh, because of the conflicts that they had had with Spain. Uh, you know, it's starting, it's starting off with simple things like fishing, and beginning to try to look for timber, uh, and beginning to look for uh, items like sugar. And little by little, uh, they begin to uh, uh, recognize that travel can bring them much more than in those things. Another reason uh, why many people uh, would begin uh, to, uh, to go and explore at this point uh, was that Europeans at this time period want to find a better way uh, to get luxury items from Asia. Uh, now, uh, we've said in the past there had been, uh, there had always been this interest for sort of the uh, high end items that you could get in the East. I think of you know, silk and spices and pearls and all those kind of things. Uh, but previously, um, we had said uh, that there was, for instance, uh, the uh, we had said there was a silk road. 
We had said also that previously the Europeans, uh, if they wanted to, um, they also um, they were able to at times go uh, to uh, the Byzantine Empire uh, and uh, the city, its capital city to be able to get some of these items. After the Silk Road basically collapses, and after the Ottoman Turks take over uh, the city of Constantinople, Western Europeans can't use those markets anymore to be able to get all these goods. But there's still this demand for them. Um, and uh, in addition to the things from Asia, too, um, there's also a, a desire for some of the items that we've mentioned to, uh, to the south in Africa, things like we had said uh, uh, gold, ivory, and uh, uh, slaves as well. The other reason why many Europeans will choose uh, to go as far during this period are missionary efforts. And in fact, some of the same exact voyages that will largely be composed of people uh, who simply wanted to trade or raid. Um, the, the best, uh, some of these uh, missions would also go off for people like Franciscans and Dominicans uh, who uh, uh, had very different goals in traveling to these places, which was, of course, to convert people. And sometimes, by the way, these, uh, these desires clash with one another. Like it's really hard to convert people after they're dead. Uh, so, but at least some people, they, her primary goal was to expand the boundaries of Christianity. Unlike elsewhere uh, in the world, we think that Western Europe, um, they actually actively support um, all of this, this exploration. We have said, for instance, one of the great problems that uh, China and uh, explorers would face was that the Chinese government was dead set against this kind of exploration, but it was very different uh, in Western Europe. And in fact, uh, there's even um, a, a theory of mercantilism, um, which really in some ways, mercantilism was that this, um, this overarching economic theory that helped provide justification uh, for the kinds of things that Europeans was do, were doing. What uh, this theory taught was that every single nation wants to maximize its profits. Uh, and, and especially when they thought of profits, when they thought of wealth, what they thought was basic mineral resources, things like gold and silk. So you, as a country, want to get as much of this as possible. And the goal, basically, of this, of this ideal is that you want to extract wealth from other places and bring them back to the home country. Uh, you really didn't care about what, what happened to that. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, this uh, idea then uh, meant that um, uh, European governments begin to think a lot about how to promote, how to regulate trade and commerce. Uh, they want to create national monopolies so that their countries can benefit at the expense of others. In this economic theory, um, really behind it is this idea that competition uh, is, uh, is the, the driving force, because all these countries wanted to maximize their own profits. And the only way that you could get more uh, was by depriving others of resources. There's no sort of idea that you know, every, the water can rise together, that everyone can benefit. The idea was to try to get as much as possible for yourself uh, and to deprive others of the same wealth. And in fact, uh, this is one of the facts that this sort of competition ends up actually making Western Europeans stronger. Um, all of them, in fact, begin to uh, uh, compete to how fast, how much money they can get, uh, and how they can move for others. In part two, this is a story of Europeans beginning uh, to take advantage of new technology that allow them then to do this exploration. Uh, for instance, using uh, a rudder on their ships to be able to maneuver. Using um, two kinds of different sails uh, on their ships to be able to take advantage of different kinds of winds. Also, making use of new navigational instruments. Uh, most important here was the magnetic compass. Now, if you're going to go to the open seas, you're not going to be able to see land, you need to have a compass to tell you which direction you're going in, because otherwise it's very easy to get lost. Uh, so this was a key if there was a sail across the deep sea. Now perhaps more than anything else though, uh, when, once Europeans begin to get to some of these places, 
it, it's their weapons that really are going to allow them to dominate. Uh, Europeans spend a lot of time thinking, uh, trying to refine, first of all, um, how to take gunpowder and how to make gunpowder far more powerful than it's ever been before. How to build uh, good rifles uh, than uh, using, uh, again, using the best kind of metals. Uh, and in fact, um, being able to master these weapons meant that Europeans would often send out much smaller uh, groups of people against much, much larger ones uh, and still successfully manage to, uh, to scare them into submission. As I mentioned earlier, um, among Western Europeans, the innovators uh, in the field of exploration are the Portuguese. Uh, and in, in effect, especially this man here, known as Henry uh, the Navigator, uh, who is a royal prince uh, in Portugal. He never actually becomes king. And it really was Henry the Navigator's dream to put some of these ideas into practice. Two, for instance, um, he had some of these Portuguese soldiers conquer a fort in what today is modern day Morocco. And then, little by little, um, you know, starting from here, um, Portuguese sailors would begin to creep down the West African coast, um, along the way setting up all sorts of trading posts, um, and uh, you know, finding strategic locations in which they could uh, take most advantage of uh, uh, the trading opportunities that were there. And uh, they knew that um, many of these West African uh, nations they came to contact with, um, they wanted European horses, they wanted uh, leather, uh, other forms of clothing, and then they could get, in exchange, gold, uh, other precious metals, and slaves. Henry may have been the one who started this, but in fact, um, even before, uh, after his death, uh, the Portuguese still start pouring money uh, into these explorations. The idea now that um, these things could actually be profitable. Um, in the beginning, they were not. But little by little, uh, this trade you can be convinced the mother was. And in fact, um, perhaps the, the biggest, um, sorry, come back a little bit. The, the biggest um, sort of step in this process was the Portuguese, instead of just creeping down little by little West Africa, finally they made uh, the great move of getting around the southernmost tip of, of South Africa, Cape of Good Hope. Um, ironically, I uh, mean, because in fact this is an extremely treacherous place to say, um, which is a good hope is a kind of a hopeful statement uh, that you'll actually make it. Uh, but if you look closely at the map, you'll see what, why this was such a big, a big ideal. Once the Portuguese had made it around, you'll notice what lies in front of them. Now, all of a sudden, they can go to India directly. Uh, they can go to all sorts of places uh, in uh, Asia directly, without now having to work through any middleman. They could just go and trade for themselves. And in fact, as you can see here, Portuguese begin to pop up all over the place in Asia uh, to begin to trade. Here are them, for instance, uh, in Japan, but in all sorts of other places as well. Uh, and all of those great goods that Europeans wanted, silk and spices and you know uh, pepper and that sort of thing, um, now, in fact, they can go trade for themselves at a much more reasonable rates because they didn't have to worry about uh, Muslim merchants or other merchants marking up the price before it hit your markets. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Portuguese begin to set up a shop in all sorts of places. In India, they had posts all over the place. Once the Portuguese had started this process, though, um, uh, they, uh, they would very soon have all sorts of competitors in the market. And in fact, um, the, the English and the Dutch began to recognize um, that uh, they too wanted in on the same markets now that the Portuguese had previously had all for themselves. And in fact, both the English and Dutch, um, they, uh, they begin to build their own ships, which are faster, cheaper, and more powerful than the Portuguese examples. So in fact, um, they started playing the same game as the Portuguese, but they did it a lot better than the Portuguese had been doing it until that point. And, uh, as in fact, the English and the Dutch get into this game, uh, they begin to form um, um, what they refer to as joint stock companies. Uh, 
basically, that's the same idea uh, we have is that you can buy stock in a company. Some of these journeys uh, into the East, uh, everybody knew um, that um, they, you had to pay a huge amount of money uh, to be able to take these journeys, to furnish the ships, to get the men, uh, all of these things. And the last thing uh, individuals wanted to do was to take all the rest of themselves. Uh, because one of these ships went down, trust me, the ships went down over time, uh, that's it, the money's gone. And so, in fact, investors begin to pool their resources. Everyone buys a share, everyone shares the risks, and everyone shares the rewards if they're successful. And in fact, they, uh, they start getting lots of money from these, uh, and really many financial windfalls. In the process, this really creates what we might refer to as the first truly global trading system that has ever existed. Of course, none of these um, tales of exploration is complete uh, with, uh, without our friend here. Christopher Columbus. Uh, Christopher Columbus um, was a, a sailor from what today is modern day Italy. In fact, it was for years, by the way, historians did not know that he actually was Italian because uh, he ended up sailing with the, the Spaniards. Uh, and in fact, discovered he's from the, uh, the city of Genoa, which was many, many, uh, one of these many cities uh, that had done very well for itself as a shipping, uh, as a shipping city. The sh a city with a lot of ships. Uh, so he had grown up in this environment in which uh, sailing uh, was a normal thing. <laughs> Columbus decided uh, uh, that, uh, like many of his time, he wanted to go directly to Asia uh, for the same reasons, the commercial reasons that we've already talked about. Now, um, there were two major problems, though. I mean, Columbus does actually sit down. And he, he uh, maps out how long this would take him, and he does all sorts of calculations. Uh, there's, there's two major problems, though, with what Columbus is planning to head on. The first was he actually thought he knew the world was a globe. Everyone knew the world was a globe. Um, he, uh, his calculations were uh, really vastly off. He thought the world was much smaller than it actually is. So uh, when he thought he was going to hit Asia, uh, in fact, he, he really would have been nowhere near it. The other problem that Columbus runs into, and this is probably an even larger problem, uh, was that he didn't recognize that, in fact, he was about to hit this huge land mass over here, uh, that, in fact, he did not know of its existence before then. Uh, and, uh, we had said earlier, in fact, I mean, that, I mean, it's not as if um, no Western Europeans in the Middle Ages had ever gotten to the, uh, the so-called New World. Um, we said Vikings had actually landed in, uh, uh, for instance, what today is, uh, is parts of Canada. But they, they had left absolutely no legacy. No one knew about, in fact, that this territory was here. Uh, and that both complicates uh, and, in fact, makes uh, Columbus' journey that much more interesting. Uh, because, in fact, um, what he would discover would end up being uh, immensely more profitable uh, than had he just managed to discover a new route to Asia. Um, the Spaniards, who really felt in some way that they were falling behind in the competition of exploration, were happy to bankroll uh, El Columbus's expeditions. Um, he would land in the Bahamas, uh, and he would refer to the natives initially as Indians, because he thought, in fact, he probably had hit India uh, by his calculations. Um, Columbus would sail around the Caribbean. He would make three more voyages across the Atlantic. Uh, but sadly, unlike the things he had promised to his Spanish masters, he would never produce a lot of gold, and he certainly didn't produce Asia. Uh, everybody was uh, aware of that. However, um, you can imagine the news of what he had discovered really shoots like wildfire around Western Europe, and in fact. Um, now, uh, very quickly, it was not just Spanish ships that go over uh, to the New World. It's the English, the French, the Dutch, uh, all of them. Uh, people begin to recognize just uh, you know, very, very quickly the kinds of opportunities for businessmen that this vast new terrain had opened up, uh, both for um, conquest and then for settlement as well. This is going to lead, this, uh, this journey is going to lead uh, to what uh, these new kind of global exchanges between uh, the new and the old world, uh, sometimes referred to 
uh, after the name Columbus as the Columbian Exchange. And uh, these are really new links between all lands and peoples of the world. Uh, and uh, really an unprecedented volume of exchanges between societies and cultures. Um, some of the exchanges that would take place, the ones we think of uh, really first often, uh, because they would have the most negative consequences, are the kinds of biological exchanges that would occur between the old and the new world. Uh, in, in particular, um, the native people of the Americas did not have resistance to many diseases that in both Europe and Asia uh, had simply, uh, people had simply become immune to them as a matter of course. Uh, and uh, if you have exposed all these people who had never had any of these diseases, uh, that they're just going to uh, become infected extremely easily. And so they did. Um, the worst scourge of the diseases that Europeans would bring over with them was smallpox, but measles, measles and influenza would also attack people. Um, and so those people had no inherited immunities to any of these diseases. Um, the exchange biologically on the other side was not quite as terrible. Uh, most people tend to think that one of the very few diseases that makes it from the new world to the old world uh, is syphilis. Uh, so that does actually uh, kill some people, depending upon uh, you know, what your activities are in your leisure mode. These ferocious, um, these ferocious uh, epidemics that come will absolutely destroy entire civilizations in their wake. Uh, remember the Aztec Empire? Um, really, the Aztec Empire uh, falls not really as a result of any kind of military conquest. It is disease that absolutely brings the Aztec Empire down to its knees um, with no time at all. And in fact, it, it, disease does a lot of the work then in combination uh, with the fact that Europeans had much better weapons um, than any of the groups they came into contact with. Uh, in particular, sometimes people refer to uh, uh, some of um, the soldiers that would pour in from Spain as conquistadores, a word that simply means conquerors uh, at this time period. Um, and uh, they came in, of course, with guns and horses. There were no horses in the New World. Uh, so, in fact, they could not counter uh, with soldiers and horseback. Uh, and uh, altogether, uh, the, uh, the loss of human life was, was uh, absolutely catastrophic in many ways. Uh, we think altogether, uh, approximately 100 million people would have died in the New World in all. On a slightly more positive side, um, there's a, another sort of aspect of Columbia Exchange that people talk about. And in fact, this is an exchange of especially agricultural products that goes back and forth between the New and the Old World. Uh, so for instance, uh, things like uh, from Europe, to the Americas, um, people would import uh, wheat, uh, vines, uh, all sorts of domestic animals, uh, cattle, sheep, pigs, uh, goats, chickens, all of these now begin to uh, pour, and they're raised now in the new world. And uh, they begin to uh, breed horses as well. From America, the Americas to, to, um, uh, to the rest of these, so the so-called old world corn, would go uh, potatoes. Um, there, there was no uh, there were no potatoes in Ireland before this point. Um, believe it or not, uh, things like beans, uh, tomatoes, peppers, um, and tobacco. Tobacco was a very popular one, of course, uh, that would go uh, to the old world. And, uh, some people would say, of course, in addition, of course, just to uh, the fact now that uh, there are a lot more different foods to eat. Um, ultimately, they would lead to having uh, a lot more protein in people's diets in both the old and the new world. Ultimately, too, um, we think, although um, demographically speaking, there's an absolute crash right after uh, the contact between the old and new world, eventually population growth would begin to reverse uh, and begin to climb again, in part uh, as a result of uh, these new foodstuffs. So, for instance, in the year uh, 1500, there are around 425 million people. Uh, by the year 1700, there are around 610 million. Those numbers are 
uh, estimates. There, of course, uh, after this point, there's a huge amount of migration that takes place between the old and new world. Some of this is, is voluntary. Uh, people who, uh, merchants, uh, or uh, people who simply wanted more opportunity, uh, people in some cases who just wanted to live uh, distinct uh, ways of religious life on their own uh, could go to the new world. We also know, of course, uh, that there's a sizable number um, uh, of uh, Europeans at this point uh, who will begin to take um, enslaved Africans uh, from both the East Coast and the West Coast, that, although especially the West Coast, uh, and uh, will set up large plantations in both South and North America. And, uh, I can say that Europeans would have been perfectly happy to enslave uh, Native Americans. Uh, it was not like they had like, some sort of policy against that. Uh, but the problem was uh, that Native Americans you said, had died in such large numbers uh, that they just didn't have the manpower, which is why they needed to switch off uh, and then need to tap into the African uh, market instead. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, uh, many of those lands that had been depopulated by disease or military assault then would be repopulated uh, by Europeans. So what's the upshot of all this? Altogether, these new contacts, and especially the ones we talked about um, involving uh, you know, the wake of uh, Columbus's uh, travels, um, these, uh, these new contacts would provide really this striking change in world history altogether. One which, of course, you, you will not actually take the journey for the rest of the time, uh, this is the end of the course, uh, but trust me on this one. The biggest change that's going to occur at the institution right here is that all of a sudden, one culture, Western European culture, is going to begin to dominate the rest of the world as no one single culture had ever done in this entire course. Uh, and in fact, uh, this one civilization uh, was going to send out its models of law, religion, art, uh, politics, um, and into, uh, into every corner of the globe. Uh, and in effect, uh, basically, um, North and South America, for all intents and purposes, are uh, in effect going to be European uh, in uh, many of uh, their outlooks and ways of life. Uh, and in fact, even places that do not have direct colonization. Uh, so think about places like, for instance, uh, in most places uh, in, in Africa, in India, they're still going to be heavily dominated by Western European models of civilization. And uh, again, even now, of course, we can see the results of this process. Um, this is the reason, of course, that we are all speaking English now. Not because there's something inherently uh, better about English than any other language, but it just happens to be that, of course, uh, the um, people of England were some of the best uh, colonizers during this period. I cannot even begin to tell you what a minority language, for instance, that Spain, the Spanish was at one point. Um, there was one point in which Spanish was a language spoken by a tiny group of people uh, in the northern part of Spain. Uh, and the only reason it survived is because the Muslims who owned the majority of Spain chose not to, to uh, kill them all. Uh, and they, they, the reason why Spanish is this sort of language that is very close to Latin in many ways. It's an archaic language. Um, the reason why Spanish goes from a language that has almost no speakers to one of the most dominant languages in the world is, again, because the Spanish were very, the Spanish were very good uh, at colonizing uh, during this time period. This is, of course, also the reason um, uh, why both Catholicism and Benedictine monasticism spread throughout the world. Uh, Benedictine monasticism, I'll remind you, started off as one monastery uh, in one part of Italy. And, uh, in part because of uh, this, this exploration in this period, uh, this discovery of the territory, the setting of new monasteries, uh, and began to spread even more widely. Finally, if I may say so, uh, this is why um, you were at a college, specifically at a liberal arts college right now. Um, there are many different ways as a teacher, I mean, you know, um, many uh, Greek, ancient Greek thinkers thought it was perfectly fine to just wander around. Uh, having conversations, uh, which you get, um, we don't do, obviously. Um, the liberal arts was a specific model that was adapted by Western Europeans during the Middle Ages, 
um, it's a model that, again, uh, really in some ways was uh, what the undergirding belief was that uh, an educated person should not uh, only know one subject. You should have, uh, you should be able to, in fact, master several. Uh, you should be taught to think. Uh, and then this was a method uh, that, as we had said, especially in the Central Middle Ages, was very important for turning around European society uh, and uh, really providing now a group of people who could think on their feet, who could master many different disciplines, uh, and who could uh, do all sorts of things. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, all of this is a Western European model at heart. Because I cannot now open this any possible, any closer to your experience, uh, I will close with that. Uh, please make sure folks be ready for the final, uh, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. So what we'll be, uh,